Welcome to this week's Ask EMBN show. Me and Steve are gonna bang our heads together. We've got loads of questions in this week from commuting, soft tires, soft shocks, all coming up in this week's EMBN show. It's the big softy. So the first question on this week's supple show is from Bubbly12. There's a deep water crossing on our local loop that the guys do on their mountain bikes. They always take the mick out of me for going over the bridge on my lever, which is an e-mountain bike. Am I doing the right thing by avoiding it or should I go for it? What's your thoughts on water crossings? It depends how deep it is, Exactly, it? yeah. I think if you're going above the bottom bracket, then you're definitely gonna run into some water, probably ingestion into the motor as well. So maybe you are doing the right thing, yeah, but I wouldn't go any deeper than that. And if you are gonna go through it, I'd just go for it super steady, just that nice much, and slow. Much, yeah, about that kind of deep, would be fine. That's probably, but, yeah, just go to the bottom bracket. Yeah, something like that. And you should be fine, run into no problems. Um, it's just obviously if you go deeper than that, you could get water into the battery connections and wiring, definitely a no-go. Just give them some banter back mm -hmm. and just get over the bridge and you can you can give banter back on the rest of the ride, mm -hmm. so don't worry about it. Exactly. Uh, this is from Henri. Henri is asking, thinking of commuting to work on my Powerfly. Mm -hmm. Any tips? Tires draggy? <sighs> I think when you're commuting, I've, I've actually been doing it this week on my Kinevo on the road, um, and it is a little bit hard work, obviously, when you're above that limiter. I just pump the tires up, just, you know, get on with it, basically. Head down, try and keep off the main roads as well, try and sort of mix it up with byways, bridleways, anything I can do to escape so the traffic. So there's two, two answers to that question. If you're staying on the road, mm. then I'd suggest you go for low profile, hard compound, high pressure tires, okay. and maybe narrow as well. Yeah. Whereas if you're gonna involve a bit of off-roading onto your loop to work, then maybe stay stay with the soft compound and large volume tires, yeah, right? Definitely, yeah. But it's great fun. Chris loves it. We've got a commute video actually, so check this one out. Think about your route. Try adding in any pump tracks, skate parks, and any urban areas that can add a bit of variety to your commute. Or is that toad face? To I don't know, toad face, I think. What does he say, Chris? I weigh 200 or she, sorry. I weigh 200 pounds and ride a large Kinevo. The rear suspension feels really soft out of the box. Should I go for a heavier spring? So the Kinevo comes with a 550 on this size large? Yeah, it varies. Uh, yeah, I think it is, yeah, on the Olins. Um, actually, when I got my large Kinevo, I did find it undersprung. I weigh about 200 pounds and I actually took my bike to TF Tuned and they swapped it out. For the style of riding I do, I actually run the heaviest spring they do, a 708, but obviously I tend to ride like quite big sort of free ride style I, stuff on mine. I think it's a really good idea to go to a suspension mm. specialist near near wherever you are, if, you, if you've got someone near. And then they've usually got a range of springs that'll fit mm. because um, I, I think it's a really good first point of call. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't really like to say what weight spring would suit you because I don't know what style of rider you are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely I think the Levo with a standard spring for someone Kinevo. 200 pounds, sorry, the Kinevo mm -hmm. with a standard spring for someone over 200 pounds is a little bit on the weak side. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you like going big as well. Um, we've got this one in from Wario. He's saying double crown forks. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Love the look of them. Oh, uh, I think they give you massive confidence mm -hmm. on technical terrain. Yeah. Uh, they're certainly well suited to e-mountain bikes with a heavier weight on them. Um, Real stiff as well, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, what are the disadvantages though? Uh, so the disadvantage of a triple clamp fork is if they come, if, if you're riding an e-mountain bike, which is say got 150 mil travel or 180, if you're putting a, a what is normally a 200 mil triple clamp fork in the bike, that's going to heighten the bottom bracket. Which could be good or bad, I suppose, couldn't it? Not really. I mean. <laughs> It obviously it depends on the depends on your bottom bracket height in, in the first place. If your bottom bracket is actually too low, mm -hmm. say you've got a um, I don't know three hundred and twenty millimeter bottom bracket, that could certainly do with raising to stop pedal strike. But if you raise your bottom bracket too high, that's going to do, to raise your center of gravity, which is going to make 
cornering uh, not as balanced or as fast as it would be mm. on a really uh, a really good sweet spot bomb bracket height. Yeah, and obviously cost as well. If you're thinking about things like uh, longer front brake hose, you're obviously going to need to calculate that and bleed in it. And sometimes even the front wheel, the front hub is different. They tend to run like a 20 mil axle as well. Mm. So swapping that out is quite a big thing as well on the front. Yeah, it's good. I mean, in general, you've got to be really, really careful fitting a triple clamp fork cube bike because uh, it'll shift your weight rearwards, which is going to affect your weight balance of the bike. So it's pointless putting a triple clamp fork onto a bike which is not designed for it. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. Prince Paita, what's your thoughts on lockout shocks and forks on e-bikes? So uh, can you use your lockout on? I've never used it on mine, I don't think. No, I think, I think lockouts are, it's probably for a, a non-e-bike mm. scenario. I think I, those shocks have kind of come across from, yeah, like a standard mountain bike, haven't they? It's not. I, having said that, I think if you, like we talked about commuting uh, earlier on, if you spend a lot of time commuting, then locking the fork and the shock out is actually a really good thing. Mm. I mean, it comes as stock on certain e-mountain bikes, such as the Scott, where you can lock the fork and the rear shock at the same time. I think it's a good thing when you go on those on those road transfers, mm. but in an off-road setup, I think it's good to keep keep the fork and the suspension, rear exactly. suspension supple, so mm. you, you're getting those tires really digging into the terrain. Definitely. Uh, Daddy Longlegs, he's saying, I've been, a keen, <laughs> I've been a keen road cyclist for years and dabbled in cross-country mountain biking, but I have just brought my first EMTB, a fine Cannondale Matera. Question is, clips or should I just try flats? I think mostly for my style of riding, I think the majority, I would say, is are in towards flats for e-mountain bikes, but it depends on the style of riding. I think, you know, guys like Fabian Burrow, you know, who you've ridden, who you've ridden with. Fabian Burrell is the double world downhill champion, and I've seen him ride technical uphill mm. climbs on an e-mountain bike like nobody in, else in the world has done. It's mm. insane. I think seeing him do that on clips actually totally blew my mind. It means you can just get a little bit of pull up some mm. of the steps. So. Yeah. It's definitely something that I want to try in the future, but yeah. uh, Chris is definitely scared of doing it. Loving flats, yeah, I just like that. As for the, especially when you're learning on an e-bike, it's quite easy to get into some sticky situations. So be able to stick your foot out in a corner or a climb is quite a good thing, especially if you're quite new to it. So mm -hmm. maybe get started on flats and maybe try clips one or two, you know. Yeah, definitely goes. with you on that. Cool. Rocket Dog! Rocket Dog. He's asking, uh, I adapt my route to try and avoid lifting my e-bike if possible. However, my wife really struggles with lifting hers. Any other tips apart from getting the local Chinook in to lift them over the gates? Ooh. <laughs> well, the first thing is, have you actually tried to see if the gate opens in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the times there can be styles yeah. and the there's a gate next to it. Now, a lot of the time with public rights of way and obviously you shouldn't be riding footpaths, but on bridleways, Sometimes you've got a style next to a gate, but actually the bridleway goes through the gate. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing there's nothing wrong with you actually going through the gate rather than going over the style. Yeah, and I think lifting wise, you just make sure you turn the motor off, try and just grab mine even nice and low by the bottom bracket and try and pull it up as much under my yeah. arm for low lift. Do you, do you know what, you be really careful with lifting your mm -hmm. e-mountain bikes because someone said to me last week that they pull the cable out of the motor simply because when you, if you've got a barbed wire fence and you're lifting the bike over, sometimes you can snag that uh, that power lead cable, yeah. or not, not sorry, not the power lead, the sensor cable, yeah. which will actually mean the end no, of your ride. So you yeah. be really careful when you lift an e mountain bike. Or well, a hiker bike as well, what's your tips to that, Steve? You've got to get your e bike up on your shoulders. You've got to be pretty strong for that one. But... Now, I actually saw Chris Smith on his epic adventure in Aaron My showing book. the perfect technique for carrying your e mountain bike. So here's a short clip, clip sorry, of Chris in the mountains. Now when the trail gets super technical, just pushing your bike like I am is really hard work. You've got all those steps to try and bounce your bike up as well. So a really good way of doing it is a hiker bike technique. Now we've done a few videos on it before, but the way you do it is just drop that pedal down to six o'clock, get on your desired side, you wanna pick the bike up. Also remember to turn your power off as well, just to make sure the motor doesn't kick in. Grab the forks, grab the seat tube, big long lift up onto your shoulder. That way it makes getting up those steps a lot, lot easier. Lion bar neck. He's, <laughs> uh, each time I land a drop off or jump, I feel I land really heavy on my e-bike compared to my regular mountain bike. My knees and wrists can't take much more. 
This is all for you, Chris Smith. You um, must know. How much longer can your knees and wrists take? I don't know, they feel pretty worn out already. Yeah. But I think you really need to think about the technique you're doing. Don't just rely on your bike to take that impact. You really need to use your body as well. So just make sure you're using your wrists, elbows, neck, but back. He, but he's saying joint. that, his wrist, he's he asked, what are you saying? Yeah, but I think you just even need to relax as well. Think about the technique, make sure you're matching your down slopes really good. Because if you're coming into drops on a down slope and you're landing back wheel first, obviously the front wheel is going to whip down really hard. So just try and match your wheels to the down slope you're riding. Just try and stay smooth, relax, and it should be a bit easier, hopefully. Can you, you can build up to that as well, right? Yeah, definitely. Just work up nice and slow, yeah. building the size of the jumps up. But it shouldn't be any different than your regular bike. And finally, this from Floss a Boss, who says, I have a new Canyon Spectral on. When I select walk mode, it doesn't do a thing. What is going on? So when you select that mode, you actually need to hold the paddle down as well. You don't just press you mean the paddle. Lead. The actual shifter, if you've got the E8000 shifter, you will have two obviously power modes to select up and down. Mm -hmm. But the lower one, you just need to hold when it's engaged walk mode. Then you should see it spool up and start moving the back wheel. So make sure you're holding it down. Don't just select it. But if you've got the if you've got the simpler E7000 version, yeah, you've just got the walk button. You push it, right? Yeah, just push the button. But e either way, you need to be actually holding it down, not. Just so would it. you suggest maybe trying to swap out the E8000 system for the E7000 system? Yeah, slightly more robust, I think it's a lot easier to use and it allows the dropper post to be moved closer to the grip and things like that. Mm. Now, I said finally, that isn't finally. We've no, got one, one more, more question mm. from uh, Del Zachary, yeah. who says, I find after long descents, I can barely hold on anymore. I lose feeling in my hands and sometimes I have to peel my hand away from the bars at the bottom of the downhill section. How can I avoid this sensation? Uh, well, that's, that's cramp, right? Arm I mean, cramp, yeah. I mean, I remember doing a stage in the Trans Provence once, it was like, I don't know, 30 minutes long, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I couldn't actually, I couldn't actually get my hands off the handlebars because I had lock-ons. Yeah. And uh, Slide your hand off, I've had it in the Alps before on some of those big descents, it's horrendous, isn't it? Yeah. But what's your tip for avoiding the dreaded arm pump? Uh, I think you gotta look at. I remember once I did a run where my tyres were way too hard and my fork was real hard, and I adjusted that. Went to I, one of the suspension setup guys. They sorted my fork out, lost a few psi in the front tyre, and it made a world of difference. So maybe things like that. I mean, if you're talking arm pump, uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's there's so this is a huge huge subject. I mean, it can go so extreme. Some people actually have surgery to to do. Um, to work on their... It's carpal tunnel, is it carpal No, it's, it's not that. They have, anyway, so they have some kind of mm. surgery, but I think there's so many elements to this. The first thing is tire pressure. The second thing is your suspension setup, your fork setup on your bike. Have you got too much compression on that? Um, but uh, you've got other things such as what size grips are you running? Yeah. And more importantly, what size bike have you got? Because the size of your bike has a huge impact mm. on the fatigue levels which you face when you're riding down long sections. So that is probably my first port of call. Are you actually riding the right size bike? But that really is this week's final question, Steve. Really hope you guys have enjoyed the show today. Don't forget, if you guys got any questions you want to ask us, hashtag Ask EMBN. Drop us them in the comments box below with your question. And don't forget to get involved in those mm -hmm. questions. We want to know your feedback. Maybe you've got a different answer to some of these questions. We want to hear it. This is the place to discuss mm -hmm. everything e-mountain bike tech. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.